hello and thank you for joining me today. Today we're going to do Magic and the Cinema Part 2. We're going to talk about George Melies. This is a photograph of George when he was a very young, dashing, dapper young man making movies left and right. This is a photograph of George Melies a bit older. His story is, is, uh, is fascinating. It's amazing. He is kindred, folks. He is a magician. He was born and bred in the magic. Uh, his life was magic. He recognized the power of the cinema to create wonder. And that's why he took to it. That's why the early magicians took to it, folks. When I consider the cinema, when I consider the magic of the cinema, we forget about it today. If you could go back to the early days, to the turn of the last century, and you could experience the cinema for the first time, it would create the same sense of wonder that a great magic show does. And Méliès understood this. That's why he wanted to bring it to the masses. That's why David Devant wanted to bring it to the masses. The cinema and magic were one and the same back in the early days. We forget. We forget. When we go to the movies today, when we go to the movies today, we see magic, but we don't see it that way. It is so embedded in context. It is so embedded in narrative that we forget that things are disappearing, things are appearing, things are appearing out of time and space. We forget that all those things are magical effects. The early cinematographers, the early filmmakers understood this intimately. They were magicians. They brought this to the table. George Méliès, folks. Marie George Jean Méliès, born December 8, 1961, crossed over January 21st, 1938. He was a French illusionist first before he was a filmmaker. He was an actor and one of the first, if not the first, film directors. He popularized such techniques as substitution splices, multiple exposures, time-lapse photography, dissolves hand-painted color, and storyboards. I'm not sure that he invented all those techniques, but he popularized them in his filmmaking. He created A Trip to the Moon 1902, and I believe, you know, I have a vague memory of this. I, I used to go to the Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. on a regular basis. I remember seeing the spaceship that he used to film A Trip to the Moon. Now, it's possible there was a recreation. I say that because, and I'll get to this in a moment, so much of what he created was destroyed either during the First World War or shortly thereafter. He himself destroyed many things because of some poor decisions he made. <laughs> and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment as well. In 1871, uh, he began to build. Now, he, he's, he's going to be about 10 years old at this point. 1871, he begins to build cardboard puppet theaters. And he moved on to craft even more sophisticated marionettes as a teenager. So he's building sets as a child and he's building these marionettes to play act in these sets. So you can see the early seeds planted here in Melies to become such a pioneer filmmaker. In the early 1880s, his father, who ran the family business, sent him to London to work as a clerk for a family friend and to improve his English. While in London, he began to visit the Egyptian Hall. I have been meaning to do a, a, a video on the Egyptian Hall. Imagine it's, it's 1880, 85, 1886. You're, you're, dre you're walking down the street in, in, in London and you come across, you see brownstone after brownstone and there's this, there's this one that has, that looks like an Egyptian temple from the outside. The House of Mystery, folks. You, you have arrived at the House of Mystery. Masculine and divan. Magicians from all over the world came to the Egyptian Hall to study magic, to look at the cutting edge of magic. This would have been the David Copperfield of the Victorian age. Uh, Keller famously hired away the mechanics so that he could learn the secret of the levitation. 
But here it is in the early 80s, and he's coming to the Egyptian hall, and he is smitten with the magic bug. From that point on, he wants to be an illusionist, just like John Neville Maskelyne. He develops a lifelong passion for magic. By the late 1880s, he's performing magic on stage professionally. In 1888, the year of Jack the Ripper, in case you're wondering, yes, the Ripper did his rampage through Whitechapel in 1888. In 1888, Millier's father retired and George Millier sold his share of the family business to his two brothers. With the money from the sale, he went and purchased the theater Robert Houdin. The very theater that Robert Houdin owned and operated and performed in was purchased by George Méliès to become his own theater of magic. From 1888 to 1898, Méliès personally created over 30 new illusions that brought, that brought more comedy and melodramatic pageantry to performances just like those he had seen at the Egyptian Hall. So he was using the Egyptian Hall as a model in creating his shows for the theater Robert Houdin. In December, in December 28, 1895, Milliers attended a special private demonstration of the Lumiere Brothers cinematograph. Did I pronounce that correctly? Cinema, anyway, it's their, it's their projector is what it is. It's their projector. So he goes and he sees movies for the first time. He offered the Lumiere brothers 10,000 francs for one of their machines. The Lumiere brothers refused, but like all great magicians, Miege was not to be turned down. He was not going to take no for an answer. He ends up finding a guy by the name of Robert Paul, who has a different machine uh, I believe it was licensed and patented under the Edison Manufacturing Company. This machine was the Animatograph. Animato, probably the same thing, just that had, uh, had Edison's stamp on it. Now, you know, I, I should probably do one of these, one of the magic and cinema, I should get into Edison a little bit. Uh, because it really, really reveals uh, a, a, an aspect of Thomas Edison's personality that probably gets less play. Uh, you know, you talk to historians you, and you, you hear a little more about it. You know, there's some, there's, uh, but if you look at the development of any industry in the United States, there's a certain amount of what I would describe as cutthroat activity. Now, Thomas Edison was trying to patent up all these things the film that goes into the projector, the projectors themselves, the movies that were created, he recognized one of the one of the one of the genius of Edison was his ability to recognize potential when he saw it. So he recognized the potential in cinema and he began to patent all these things and then he would sell them or license them at exuberant prices. This is one of the reasons folks why the early filmmakers settled in California. Picture this, Edison's in New York, right? He's got a stranglehold on the film industry in New York. People got as far away from Edison as they could get. Hollywood, California. And that's where they began their studios, so they could get out from under Edison's stranglehold. More on that later. Anyway, Méliès finds the projector through Robert Paul. In, eight, in April of 1896, the Theater Robert Houdin was showing films as part of its daily performance. This is the way the movies began. You know, you had a magician who recognized the incredible potential of the cinema to create awe, to create wonder. And they thought, this, this is a natural fit for a magic show. So here's George Méliès. Here's George Méliès owning the theater Robert Houdin, the father of modern magic. He's doing, he's creating his own illusions, just like John Neville Maskelyne in the Egyptian Hall. He recognizes this incredible power of cinema to create wonder and awe, and he brings this into to the theater Robert Houdin. Milliers modified the animatograph so that it would serve as a film camera. Milliers developed and printed his movies 
through trial and error. There was nobody showing you how to make movies back in these days. Nobody showing you how to edit film. This guy did it by trial and error. May 1896 to 1913. Millier's directed and created over 500 films. 500 films. Many were magic shows where the illusions were accomplished by the brand new field of special effects in cinema. September 9, 1896, Milliers built a film studio just outside of Paris. 1917, the French army turned the main studio building of his Montreal property, Montreal property into a hospital for wounded soldiers, they confiscated over 400 of his films and prints, melted them down to use the chemical properties to make things of war. Uh, this, the, the, this was the beginning of a devastating period for George Smilliers. He comes into World War I. Of course, you know, it, it was, you had, you had on the heels of, of, uh, of 1915, or, or uh, coming coming out of World War One, you had the, the of course the pandemic of that age. So you had massive death because of the war, massive death because of the pandemic. Uh, the state d decided to take whatever assets they could to survive and, and maintain during the war. Uh, it was devastating for George Milliers. 1923, Theodore Robert Houdin was torn down. Milliers also lost control of his of his, of his uh, cinema uh, studio, his, uh, his, his company called Star Films and the studio. In a rage because of this loss, uh, Milliers burned all of the negatives of his film as well as most of the sets and costumes. He destroyed everything because he was frustrated and angry and upset. And you know, I mean, it had to have been a horrible period of time. As a result, many of his films do not exist today. Nonetheless, just over 200 films have indeed been preserved because there were prints that were available and other things that people were able to preserve. In 1925, at this point, he is almost forgotten. Uh, the world has moved on. He is working at a small candy shop and toy stand. And Film historians are beginning to look back and wonder, where did we come from? How did this begin? How did we get to where we are? And naturally, the name of George Melies came up. So historians began to seek him out at his candy store and interview him, and his fame began to build. From 1924 to 1926, historians started to write about George his, his fame began to build as he lay in a hospital dying. He said, he said, laugh, my friends, laugh with me. Laugh for me because I dream your dreams. Those were maybe not his last words, but part of his dying words. George Milliers passed away, crossed over of cancer, on January 21st, 1938, at the age of 76. Folks, there's just one other thing I'd like to mention. This film, Hugo, uh, it, it more or less documents this period at the end of his life when he's not particularly famous. He's working in a toy store, and this, this young man, this young man discovers him, and, uh, and, and the story is just absolutely precious. It will help you get to know uh, George Milliers. Uh, it, it is a fantastic film. I highly recommend it to you. Folks, thank you so much for joining me today. I appreciate that you did. Please subscribe if you've not done so already. Please comment down below. You know I love your comments. Thank you so much. Have a great day.